Hello, my dear students and the rest of the learners. Welcome to this presentation in which we are going to discuss on the topic device IO management in operating systems. This is part four of a five part series of videos and the presentations on this topic. In this presentation, I am going to discuss on error diagnosis, the RAM disks track at a time caching and rings. My name is MMJM, or you can simply call me Emily Swap. And therefore, the content of this presentation is error handling, track at a time, caching, RAM disks, and finally, we shall look at the rings. Let's commence with error handling or error diagnosis. Most types of disks are subject to a wide variety of errors. Some of the more common errors include programming errors, whereby these errors are those errors which occur when the driver tells the controller to seek to a non-existent cylinder, read from a non-existent sector, use a non-existent head, or transfer to or from non-existent memory. Most controllers check the parameters given to them and complain if they are invalid. If the controller indicates that a programming error has occurred, it should stop and print a message like call the programmer so that the error can be tracked down and fixed. The other action to take is to terminate the current disk request with an error and hope that it will not recur too often. Number two is what we call the transient checksum error. These are errors that are caused by specs of dust in the air that get between the head and the disk surface. Most of the time, they can be eliminated by just repeating the operation a few times. If the error persists, the block has to be marked as burnt block and get avoided. One way to avoid band blocks is to write a very special program that takes a list of band blocks as input and carefully handcrafts a file containing all the band blocks. Once this file has been made, then disk allocator will think that these blocks are occupied and never allocate them. As long as no one ever tries to read the band block file, no problems will occur. However, if the disk with band block is to be backed up, it's important to back up the disk one file at a time so as to solve the problem, provided that the backup program knows the name of the band block file and refrain from copying it. Number three are the errors that we call permanent checksum error. Another problem that cannot be solved with a band block file is the problem of a band block in a file system data structure that must be in a fixed location. Almost every file system has at least one data structure whose location is fixed so that it can be found easily. On a partitioned file system, it may be possible to repartition and work around a band track, but a permanent error in the first few sectors of a disk generally means that the disk is unusable. Intelligent controllers reserve a few tracks not normally available to the user programs. 
when a disk drive is formatted, the controller determines which bad blocks are there and automatically substitutes one of the spare tracks for the bad one. The table that maps bad tracks to spare tracks is kept in the controller's internal memory and on the disk. This substitution is transparent or invisible to the driver, except that it is carefully worked out. Elevator algorithm may perform poorly if the controller is secretly using a certain cylinder whenever another cylinder is requested. Many controllers manage new errors that may develop with use, permanently assigning substituting blocks when they determine that an error is unrecoverable. With such disks, the driver software rarely sees any indication that there is any burnt blocks. Number four, or the fourth type of error is called seek error. These are errors that are caused by mechanical problems in the arm. The controller keeps track of the arm position internally. To perform a seek, it usually issues a series of impulses or pulses to the arm motor one pulse per cylinder to move the arm to the new cylinder. When the arm gets to its destination, the controller reads the actual cylinder number that is written when the drive was formatted or when the drive is formatted. If the arm is in the wrong place, a seek error has occurred and some corrective action is required. Most hard disk controllers correct the seek errors automatically, but many floppy controllers, even though the floppy controllers are currently almost outdated, including the IBM PCs, just set an error bit and leave the rest to the driver. The driver handles this error by issuing a recalibrate command to move the arm as far out as it will go and reset the controller's internal idea of the current cylinder to zero. Usually, this solves the problem. If it does not, the drive must be repaired. Number five, or the fifth type of error is called controller error. This is an error that occurs when the controller refuses to accept the commands. Sometimes an unusual sequence of events, such as an interrupt on one drive occurring simultaneously with a recalibrate command for another drive will trigger a bug and cause the controller to go into a loop or lose track of what it was doing. Controller designers usually plan for the worst and provide a pin on the chip, which when asserted, forces the controller to forget whatever that it was doing and reset itself. If all else fails, the disk driver can set a bit to invoke this signal and reset the controllers. If that does not help, all the driver can do is print a message and give up. Modern drives also make extensive use of error correcting cones, which we abbreviate as ECCs, particularly the read Solomon, Solomon error correction, particularly the read Solomon error correction. These techniques store extra bits for each block of data that are determined by a mathematical formula. The extra bits allow many errors to be fixed. While these extra bits take up space on the hard drive, 
They allow higher recording densities to be employed, resulting in a much larger storage capacity for user data. Typical hand drives attempt to remove the data in a physical sector that is being burned to a spare physical sector, hopefully, while the number of errors in that burned sector is still small enough that the ECC can completely recover the data without loss. The smart system counts the total number of errors in the entire hard drive fixed by ECC and the total number of remapping in an attempt to predict hard drive failure. Most major hand disks and motherboard vendors now support the self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology that is smart, which measures drive characteristics such as operating temperature, spin up time, data error rates, amongst others. My dear students and the rest of the learners, remember that when we talk about smart in device IO management, we are using an acronym S -M -R -R -T to stand for self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology. Certain trends and certain changes in these parameters are thought to be associated with the increased likelihood of drive failure and data loss. However, not all failures are predictable. Normal use eventually can lead to a breakdown in the inherently fragile device, which makes it essential for the user to periodically back up the data onto a separate storage device. Failure to do so can lead to the loss of data. Eventually, all mechanical hard disk drives fail. So to mitigate the loss of data, some form of redundancy is needed, such as the read R, R, A, E, D, or R, A, I, D, read, or a regular backup system. I will explain more about reads in this presentation under the read section. Use of stable storage that uses a pair of identical disks with the corresponding blocks working together is also a good way of handling errors because it forms one error-free block. In the absence of errors, the corresponding blocks on both drives are the same. Either one can be read to or one can be read to get the same result. To achieve this goal, the following three operations are defined. Number one is what we call stable writes. The stable writes consists of first writing the block or drive one, then reading it back in order to verify that it was written correctly. If it was not written correctly, the write and reread are done again up to n times or to a number of times until they work. After a several consecutive failures or number of failures, the block is remapped onto a spare and the operation repeated until it succeeds, no matter how many spares have to be tried. After the right to drive one has succeeded, the corresponding block on drive two is written and reread repeatedly if need be until it two finally succeeds. In the absence of CPU crashes, when a stable write completes, the block has correctly been written onto both drives 
and verified on both of them. Number two is stable rinse. A stable rinse first rinse the block from drive one. If this use an incorrect ECC, the read is tried again up to a number of times. If all of these give bad ECCs, the corresponding block is read from drive two or from the second drive. Given the fact that a successful stable write leaves two good copies of the block behind, and our assumption that the probability of the same block simultaneously or spontaneously going back on both drives in a reasonable time interval is negligible, a stable read always succeeds. Number three is crash recovery. After a crash, a recovery program scans both disks, comparing corresponding blocks. If a pair of blocks are both good and the same, nothing is done. However, if one of them has an ECC error, the band block is overwritten with the corresponding good block. If a pair of blocks are both good but different, the block from drive one is written onto drive two. If the CPU crash during the stable writes, the following happens. Number one, if the CPU crash happens before either copy of the block is written during recovery, neither will it be changed and the old value will continue to exist, which is allowed. Number two, if the CPU crashes during the write to the first drive, destroying the contents of the block, the recovery program detects this error and restores the block on drive one from the second drive. Therefore, the effect of the crash is wiped out and the old state is fully restored. Number three, if the CPU crash happens after drive one is written, but before drive two is written, the recovery program copies the block from drive one to drive two, and then the write succeeds. Number four, if the central processing unit crashes during recovery, the good block overwrites the bad block. Again, the final value of both blocks is the new one. Number five, finally, the recovery program sees that both blocks are the same, and so neither is it changed and the right succeeds here too. I repeat, finally, the recovery program sees that both blocks are the same, so neither is changed and the right succeeds here too. In order to improve and optimize the application of stable storage, a non-volatile RAM, which is a special CMOS memory, is used to keep track of which block was being written during a stable write, so that only one block has to be checked during recovery. The stable write can put the number of the block it is about to update in non-volatile RAM before starting the write. After a crash, the recovery program can check the non-volatile RAM to see if a stable write happened to be in progress during the crash, and if so, which block was being written when the crash happened. The two copies of the block can then be checked for correctness and consistency. Once a day, a complete scan of both disks must be done repairing any damage. That way, every morning, both disks are always identical. 
Even if both blocks in a pair go bad or in a pair go bad, within a period of a few days, all the errors are repaired correctly. Let's now look at what we call a track at a time caching or a track at a time kicking, depending on the way you wanted to spell or pronounce this term. Either cache, cache, caching, or there are those who may say caking. With a modern hand disk, the sick and rotational delays so dominate performance that reading one or two sectors at a time is very inefficient. For this reason, many disk controllers always read and cache multiple sectors, even when only one is requested. Typically, any request to read a sector will cause that sector and much or all the rest of the current track to be read, depending upon how much space is available in the controller's cache memory. The use of the cache is determined dynamically by the controller. In its simplest mode, the cake or cache is divided into two sections, one for reads and one for writes. If a subsequent read can be satisfied out of the controller's cache, it can return the requested data immediately. The controller's cache usually holds blocks that have not actually been requested, but which were convenient. The read because they just happened to pass under the head as a side effect of some other read. I repeat, the controller's cache usually holds blocks that have not actually been requested, but which were convenient or which were conveniently read because they just happened to pass under the head as a side effect of some other read. Disk cache is a buffer in main memory for disk sectors. The cache contains a copy of some of the sectors on the disk. When an IO request is made for a particular sector, a check is made in order to determine if the sector is in the disk cache. If so, the request is satisfied via the cache. However, if this is not the case, the requested sector is read into the disk cache from the disk. Because of the phenomenon of locality of reference, when a block of data is fetched into the cache to satisfy a single I.O. request, it is likely that there will be future references to that same block. The time required to seek to a new cylinder is usually much more than the rotational delay and always vastly more than the transfer time to read or write one sector. In other words, once the driver has gone to the trouble of moving the arm somewhere, it hardly matters whether it reads one sector or a whole track. This effect is especially true if the controller provides rotational sensing so the driver can see which sector is currently under the hand and issue a request for the next sector, thereby making it possible to read an entire disk track in a single rotational time. Normally, it takes a half a rotation plus one sector time just to read a single sector or on the average. Some disk drivers take advantage of these timing properties by maintaining a secret track at a time cache and known to the device independent software. If a sector that is in the cache is needed, 
no disk transfer is required. A disadvantage of track at a time caching, in addition to the software complexity and buffer space that is needed, is that transfers from the cache to the calling program will have to be done by the CPU using a programmed loop rather than letting the DMA hardware do the job. Some controllers take this process a step further and do a track at a time caching in their own internal memory, transparent to the driver, so that the transfer between the controller and memory can use DMA. If the controller works this way, there is little point in having the disk driver do it as well. Note that both the controller and the driver are in a good position to read and write entire tracks in one command, but that the device independent software cannot because it regards a disk as a linear sequence of blocks without regard to how they are divided up into tracks and cylinders. Only the controller knows the true geometry for sure. Let's now look at what we call the RAM disks, random access memory disks. A RAM disk or a RAM drive is a block of RAM that is primary storage or volatile memory that a computer's software is treating as if the memory were a disk drive. That is, as if the memory were a secondary storage. It is sometimes referred to as virtual RAM drive or a software RAM drive to distinguish it from a hardware RAM drive that uses separate hardware containing RAM, which is a typical type of solid state drive. The figure below shows the idea behind a RAM disk. From this diagram, my dear students and the rest of the learners, you can see that what we have is the main memory, which we abbreviate as random access memory or RAM. This RAM or a section of this RAM has been divided into various parts with each part containing certain information. We have the user programs on one portion. Then we have the operating system on the other portion. In between the operating system and the user programs or the space left between the user programs and the operating system location is treated as a device on its own. And this device is viewed as a disk, that is a RAM disk. And we can see that within this portion that's it, that is treated as a disk, we have some blocks. For example, we have random access memory disk block one and several others. The read and writes of RAM block zero use this memory or just next to the operating system, that is space of RAM disk is used or the space or the partition or the section just next to the operating system is used to read and write. Or the read and writes of RAM block zero will use this memory. In other words, the partitions or the sections of the RAM disk are broken down into blocks where we have block zero, block one, block two, etc. And therefore, the first block, which we call block zero, is used to read and write. In a nutshell, what I am trying to say, my dear students and the rest of the learners, is that the space that remains between the operating system and the user program or user programs is used as a disk of its own. And this is the disk that we call the RAM disk. 
And this disk, just like the ordinary disks, is subdivided into blocks or into partitions, with each partition holding certain information, instructions, data, or even processed facts, which we call information. And therefore, each of those blocks are used for a certain purpose. And this memory is filled from block zero to block one up once. The RAM disk is split up, just as I have said, into a number of blocks, depending on how much memory has been allocated for it. Each block is the same size as the block size used on the real disks. When the driver receives a message to read or write a block, it just computes where in the RAM disk memory the requested block lies and reads from it or writes to it instead of from, from or to a floppy or hard disk. However, just as I have said, even though I am referring to floppy in certain areas, or I am mentioning the floppy drive in certain parts of this presentation, it is good, my dear students and the rest of the learners, to note that some of these drives, such as the floppy ones, are almost uh, absolute or obsolete, meaning they are outdated and they are not commonly available. A RAM disk driver may support several areas of memory used as RAM disk, each distinguished by a different minor device number. Usually, these areas are distinct, but in some fairly specific situations, it may be convenient to have them overlap, as we shall see in the next section. The performance of a RAM disk is in general orders of magnitude faster than other forms of storage media such as hard drive, tape drive, or optical drives. This performance gain is due to multiple factors, including access time, maximum throughput, and file system, as well as others. First, the access time of files are greatly decreased since a RAM disk is solid state, meaning that it has no mechanical parts. A physical hard disk drive or optical media such as CD-ROM, DVD, and Blu-ray must move a head or optical eye into position, and the tape drives must wind or rewind to a particular position on the media before reading or writing can be done or can occur. RAM disks can access data with only the memory address of a given file with no movement, alignment, or positioning necessary. Second, the maximum throughput of a RAM disk is limited by the speed of the RAM, the data bus, and the CPU of the computer. Other forms of storage media are further limited by the speed of the storage bus, such as IDE or PATA, VSATA, USB, serial or LPT, that is parallel. Compounding this limitation is the speed of the actual mechanics of the drive motors, hence, and or eyes. Hence, and or eyes. That the file system in use, such as FAT, NTFS, USB, FS, EXT2, amongst the others, uses extra accesses, reads and writes to the drive, which, although small, can end up quickly, especially in the event of many small files versus few larger files, such as temporary internet folders, web caches, amongst others. Because the storage in the RAM 
it is volatile memory, which means it will be lost in the event of power loss, whether intentional, that is computer input or shutdown or accidental or power failure, or in the case there is power failure. I repeat, the storage in RAM disk is volatile, which means that it can be lost or it will be lost in the event of power loss, whether intentional, that is when you shut down the computer or accidentally when the power fails. This is sometimes desirable. For example, when working with an encrypted copy of an encrypted file. In many cases, the data that is stored on the RAM disk is created for faster access from data permanently stored elsewhere and is recreated on the RAM disk when the system reboots. Software RAM or software RAM disks use the normal RAM in main memory as if it were a partition on a hard disk drive rather than actually accessing the data bus normally used for secondary storage. Though the RAM disks can often be supported directly from the operating system via special mechanisms in the operating system kernel, it is possible to also create and manage a RAM disk by way of a user space application process. Usually, no battery backup is needed due to the temporary nature of the information that is stored in the RAM disk, but an, in, an interruptible power supply, which we abbreviate as UPS, can keep the entire system running during a power outage if necessary. Some RAM disks use a compressed file system such as CRAMFs to allow compressed data to be accessed on the fly without any compressing it fast. This is convenient because RAM disks are often small due to the higher price per byte that conventional hard drive or than the conventional hard drive storage. The following are therefore the main uses of RAM disks. Number one, we have what we call the read ahead, read behind. When executing a read from the disk, the disk arm moves the read right hand to or near the corrected track. And after some settling time, the read head begins to pick up the bits. Usually, the first sectors to be read are not the ones that have been requested by the operating system. Then disk's embedded computer typically saves these unrequested sectors in the disk buffer in case the operating system requests for them later. Number two is speed matching. The speed of the disk's I.O. interface to the computer almost never matches the speed at which the bits are transferred to and from the hard disk platter. The disk buffer is used so that both the I.O. interface and the disk read-write head can operate at full speed. Number three, is right acceleration. The disk's abandoned microcontroller may signal the main computer that a disk write is complete immediately after receiving the right data before the data are actually written to the platter. This early signal allows the main computer to continue working even though the data has not actually been written yet. This can be somewhat dangerous because if power is lost before the data are permanently fixed in the magnetic media, the data will be lost from the disk buffer and the file system on the disk 
may be left in an inconsistent state. On some disks, this vulnerable period between signaling the right complete and fixing the data can be arbitrarily long as the right can be defined indefinitely by newly arriving requests. For this reason, the use of right acceleration can be controversial. Consistency can be maintained, however, by using a battery-backed memory system for caching data, although this is typically only found in high-end RAID controllers. Alternatively, the caching can simply be turned off when the integrity of data is deemed more important than right performance. Another option is to send data to the disk in a carefully managed order and to issue cache flash commands in the right places like ZFS file system does. Number four is command queuing. New one disks can accept multiple commands while any one command is in operation through what we call command queuing. These commands are stored by the disk's abandoned controller until they are completed. Should a read reference or should a read reference the data at the destination of a queued write, the to be written data will be returned. Command queuing is different from write acceleration in that the main computer's operating system is notified when data is actually written onto the magnetic media. The operating system can use this information to keep the file system consistent through rescheduled writes. Let's now look on RAID. What is RAID? What does it stand for? And what is its purpose? RAID is an acronym which stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. This is a standardized scheme for multiple disk database design, which consists of seven levels from zero through six that designate different design architectures that share the following three common characteristics. Number one, the set of physical disk drives are viewed by the operating system as a single logical drive. Number two, the data are distributed across the physical drives of an array in a scheme that is known as striping described subsequently. Number three, redundant disk capacity is used to store parity information, which guarantees data recoverability in the case of a disk failure. The basic idea behind a rent was to install a box full of disks next to the computer, typically a large server, replace the disk controller can't with a RAID controller, copy the data over to the RAID, and then continue normal operation. The independent disks can be used together in a variety of ways. RAID can be used both to speed disk access and to make data more secure. Therefore, the RAID strategy employs multiple disk drives and distributes data in such a way as to enable simultaneous access to data from multiple drives, thereby improving the I.O. performance and allowing easier incremental increases in capacity. Typically, the drives used for RAIDs are hot swappable, meaning they can be replaced without powering down the system. 
The unique contribution of the rent proposal is to address effectively the need for redundancy. Although allowing multiple hands and actuators to operate simultaneously archives higher IO and the transfer rates, the use of multiple devices increases the probability of failure. To compensate for this decreased reliability, RAID makes use of stored parity information that enables the recovery of data lost due to a disk failure. The main different schemes of disk organizations used to form RAID are RAID level zero through RAID level six. Of the seven RAID levels described, only four are commonly used. That is RAID level zero, RAID levels one, RAID levels five, and RAID level six. Let us now look at each of these RAID levels and their responsibilities. We commence with RAID level zero. It's not a true member of the RAID family because it does not include a redundancy to improve performance or provide data protection. The user and the system data are distributed across all of the disks in the array. This has a notable advantage of the use of a single large disk. If two different I.O. requests or requests are appending for two different blocks of data, then there is a good chance that the requested blocks are on different disks. Therefore, the two requests can be issued in a parallel, reducing the I.O. queuing time. All user and system data are viewed as being stored on a logical disk. The logical disk is divided into strips. These strips may be physical blocks, sectors, or some other unit. The strips are mapped round robin to consecutive physical disks in the red array. A set of logically consecutive strips that maps exactly one strip to each array member is referred to as a stripe. The advantage of this layout is that if a single I.O. request consists of multiple logically contiguous strips, then up to a number of strips for that request can be handled in parallel, greatly reducing the I.O. transfer time. This red level is mostly used to archive or to achieve. This red level is mostly used to achieve a high data transfer rate. Red level zero works worst with operating systems that habitually ask for data one sector at a time. The results will be correct, but there is no parallelism and hence no performance gain. Another disadvantage of this organization is that the reliability is potentially worse. Because no redundancy is present in this design, it is not really a true read. I repeat, because no redundancy is present in this design, it is not really a true read. So what is read level one? This level is a true read because it duplicates all the disks. So there are four primary disks and four backup disks. On a right, every strip is written twice. On a read, either copy can be used, distributing the load over more drives. In this level, redundancy is achieved by the simple expedient of duplicating all the data. 
each logical strip is mapped to two separate physical disks so that every disk in the array has a mirror disk that contains exactly the same data. Mirroring, mirroring is having two disks that are similar with the similar content. The following are the main positive aspects of this level organization. Number one, a read request can be serviced by either of the two disks that contains the requested data, whichever one involves the minimum seek time plus rotational latency. Number two, a write request requires that both corresponding strips be updated, but this can be done in parallel. Therefore, the write performance is dictated by the slower of the two writes, that is, the one that involves the larger seek time plus rotational latency. Number three, recovery from a failure is simple. When a drive fails, the data may still be accessed from the second drive. The principal disadvantage of rent level one is the cost. It requires twice the disk space of the logical disk that it supports. Because of that, a read one configuration is likely to be limited to drives that store system software and data and other highly critical files. In these cases, RAID level one provides real-time backup of all data so that in the event of a disk failure, all of the critical data is still immediately available. Recovery consists of simply installing a new drive and copying the entire backup drive to it. In a transaction-oriented environment, RAID 1 can achieve high I.O. request rates if the bulk of the requests are released. This level may also provide improved performance over RAID level 0 for data transfer intensive applications with a high percentage of RINs. What is RAID level two? This level works on a one basis, possibly even a byte basis. The total throughput is immense. Why? Because in one sector time, it could write several sectors worth of data. This level make use of a parallel access technique whereby all member disks participate in the execution of every I.O. request. Typically, the spindles of the individual drives are synchronized so that each disk head is in the same position on each disk at any given time. As in the other end schemes, data striping is used. In this level, an error correcting code, that is ECC, is calculated across corresponding bits on each data disk. And the bits of the code are stored in the corresponding bit possessions on multiple parity disks. Typically, a humming code is used, which is able to correct single bit errors and detect double bit errors. Although this level requires fewer disks than read level one, it is still rather costly. The number of redundant disks is proportional to the log of the number of data disks. On a single read, all disks are simultaneously accessed. The requested data and the associated error correcting code are delivered to the array controller. If there is a single bit error, the controller can recognize 
and collect the error instantly so that the read access time is not slowed. On a single write, all data disks and parent disks must be accessed for the write operation. This level would only be an effective choice in an environment in which many disk errors occur. Given the high reliability of individual disks and disk drives, read 2 is overkill and is not implemented. Let us now look at read level 3. This level is organized in a similar fashion to read 2. The difference is that this level requires only a single redundant disk, no matter how large is the disk array. It employs parallel access with data distributed in small strips. Instead of an error correcting code, a simple parity bit is computed for the set of individual bits in the same position on all of the data disks. On redundancy, in the event of a drive failure, the parity drive is accessed and data is reconstructed from the remaining devices. Once the field drive is replaced, the missing data can be restored on the new drive and operation resumed. Data reconstruction is simple because the contents of each strip of data can be regenerated from the contents of the corresponding strips on the remaining disks in the array. In the event of a disk failure, all of the data are still available in what is referred to as reduced mode. In this mode, for instance, the missing data are regenerated on the fly using the exclusive all calculation. When data are written to a reduced read degree array, consistency of the parity must be maintained for later regeneration. Return to full operation requires that the field disk be replaced and the entire contents of the field disk be regenerated on the new disk. On performance, because data are stripped in every strip, this level can achieve very high data transfer rates. Any I.O. request will involve the parallel transfer of data from all of the data disks. For larger transfers, the performance improvement is especially noticeable. However, only one I.O. request can be executed at a time, and therefore, in a transaction-oriented environment, the performance suffers. Read level four. This level make use of an independent access technique whereby each member disk operates independently so that separate I.O. requests can be satisfied in parallel. Because of this, independent access arrays are more suitable for applications that require high I.O. request rates and are relatively less suited for applications that require high data transfer rates. As in the other range schemes, data stripping is used, but the strips are relatively large. In this level, a bit by bit parity strip is calculated across corresponding strips on each data disk and the parity bits are stored in the corresponding strip on the parity disk. This level involves a write penalty when an I.O. write request 
of small size is performed. Each time that a write occurs, the array management software must update not only the user data, but also the corresponding parity bits. To calculate the new parity, the array management software must read the old user strip and the old parity strip. Then it can update these two strips with the new data and the newly calculated parity. Therefore, each strip write involves two reads and two writes. In the case of a larger size I.O. write that involves strips on all disk drives, parity is easily computed by calculation using only the new data bits. Therefore, the parity drive can be updated in parallel with the data drives and there are no extra reads or extra writes. In any case, every write operation must involve the parity disk, which therefore can become a bottleneck. Read level five. This level is organized in a similar fashion to read level four. The difference is that this level distributes the parity strips across all the disks. A typical allocation is a round robin scheme. For a number of disk array, that is for an N disk array, the parity strip is on a different disk for the first N strips or for the first number of strips. And then the pattern repeats. The distribution of parity strips across all drives avoids the potential I.O. bottleneck of the single parity disk that is found in RAID level four. Further, RAID level five has the characteristic that the loss of any one disk does not result in data loss. RAID level six. In this scheme, two different parity calculations are carried out and stored in separate blocks on different disks. Therefore, a read level six array whose user data require n disks consists of n plus two disks. This level makes it possible to regenerate data even if two disks containing user data fail. The advantage of this level is that it provides extremely high data availability. Three disks would have to fail within the MTTR, that is within the mean time to repair interval to cause data to be lost. I repeat, the advantage of this level is that it provides extremely high data availability. Three disks would have to fail within the mean time to repair interval in order to cause data to be lost. On the other hand, this level incurs a substantial write penalty because each write affects two parity blocks. Red level six controller can suffer more than a 30% drop in overall write performance compared with a red level five implementation. We have come to the end of this presentation on part four. You can now proceed to listen and view part five or the last part in this series of presentations, which is on computer clock system, computer terminals, and visual devices. Congratulations for viewing and listening to this video, which is part four of the five part series of presentations in device IO management topic. You can listen 
to the other parts of device I.O. management topic, as well as other videos in the front of computers or ICT from Emily Swap ICT YouTube channel. In addition, for you to be able to access free life skills, motivational and inspirational resources, visit Emily Swap Motivation YouTube channel. I would also request that you subscribe to both the channels by clicking on subscribe button in order to be able to receive immediate updates whenever a new video is posted. For any further correspondence, kindly write it to us through the email emeliswap at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening to me and be blessed.